Well, the internment of Japanese Americans is so well documented, it's wonderful. You can go back and look at primary sources that are just text, that are the laws themselves, that are the cases. The Supreme Court did consider not one, two, or three, but four major cases that remain important precedent to this day. Those are a part of the legal background to this story. But in addition, there's been a wonderful effort to collect oral histories through the Densho Project and others, much of which is available online. And you can hear from folks who are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, even older, who will recall their memories from the time when they were, in some instances, just children, but in other instances, teenagers and already grown up, as they recount the stories of life before Pearl Harbor, during the camps, and of how after the war was over and the normalcy of the 1950s uh, was upon us, how they attempted to put together the pieces. And this gives you a sense firsthand from people who were there what it was like. You can also take a look at the many artifacts that have been preserved. There are art exhibits now of what people made arts and crafts projects where they took cast off bits of wood, where they took debris and carefully, painstakingly carved small toys and jewelry and other objects that they gave to family and friends within the camp. Because these camps involved so many people, they involved children, the elderly, entire families. This was the relocation and confinement of an entire community it was very different and it gave people an opportunity even as they were behind the barbed wire and under the gun towers and the watchful eye of soldiers to try to put together life, a different life to be sure, but to put together a life that had a sense of community and belonging. And there are many objects now that are a testament to what that life was like. There also are objects that have been saved that were part of the internment itself. Washboards, for example, that women used when they were doing laundry. This is when they didn't have washing machines and dryers. They had a single day of the week dedicated to laundry where all the women would go out and in a communal manner do the laundry. And that's painstaking, back-breaking work that most of us don't know today. But they had washboards, old-fashioned washboards and tubs, steel tubs that they had to use. And there are museum exhibits where you can see these objects, where they've been preserved, where they actually have tried to recreate the barracks or one of the rooms that they had. And so all of this helps to give people a sense of what it was really like. And these primary sources are uh, so rich in their detail and uh, in what they convey, the meaning that is packed in there, that even the best secondary source, the best nonfiction books that have been written, or fiction even, about the internment camps, those can't come close to capturing for us what a primary source can show us, what it can teach us. Even so, though, we need to have the background and context when you're just looking at an object, at a washboard or a basin. Well, you might not even know what that is. And so it has to be explained. It has to be situated within the sense of life as it was lived then. And that's why it's important for historians to do the work that they do. So the secondary sources complement the primary sources. They help us by uh, giving us the interpretive framework, because if all we're doing is looking at objects and we don't understand what those objects were for, how they fit into the day-to-day -day lives of the people who owned and used them, well, then uh, we've really missed out on an important part of the story.